Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Squirtle Squadron. So we'll give everyone a minute or two to appear. I'll tell some stories and say hi and so on. Uh, tell me how the sound is. Uh, there's a conversation happening in the other part of the house, and we'll see if, uh, if that leaks through. Seeing a few people appearing. Excellent. As people appear, uh, say hi, please, in the chat of uh, whichever platform you're using. Uh, let us know who you are and uh, what brought you here. So why are you interested in uh, writing code without engineers, uh, software without developers? Uh, let us know why you're interested in that. We'll give everybody another uh, 45 seconds or so to, to get in the door. And uh, then we'll kick off with uh, all the excitement. By the way, if you're here on a recording, uh, welcome for that. Uh, also, if people have to go, uh, feel free to uh, come back to the recording. You'll find that uh, at the same place where you're watching this now. So if you're on YouTube, it'll be on YouTube and so on. So uh, very happy to see you there on the recordings. And there are loads of recordings on the Squirrel Squadron website, uh, which I should start talking about. So uh, welcome, everybody. Very glad if, to make sure you're all in the right place. Uh, where you should be is at the Squirrel Squadron event on software without engineers, and I'm your host, Squirrel. So I uh, hope you guys have all brought your questions, and this will be a short session otherwise, which is fine with me. I can walk the dog sooner, but I'd rather you guys kept me going with lots of exciting questions on the topic of low code. Uh, and I'll, if you don't know what that is or don't know much about it, this is the place to be. I'll be explaining it in just a few moments. Before that, I should say what the Squirrel Squadron is. That's my community of people who are uh, technical and non-technical and we learn together. So uh, I'm going to learn the most out of this from, from all of you, uh, which is uh, fun and a blast. Um, uh, you guys will learn uh, lots of things about uh, new techniques you can apply, ways of interacting with your tech team or interacting with non-tech people. That's the goal of the Squirrel Squadron. So uh, we have these events every week. Uh, uh, there's not one next week because of the Jubilee, but otherwise, uh, you know, they're every week throughout the year and, uh, uh, and all different topics uh, to do with uh, tech and non-tech learning together. That's the purpose. So uh, if you're here to do that, then uh, one of the things you might want to know is is uh, what's this low code stuff all about? So I'll be talking about that. If you haven't yet, please type in the chat. Uh, let me know who you are, uh, what brought you here, uh, what questions you have. Uh, no questions. This will be a short session. That's all right with me. OK, so uh, let me start by telling a couple of stories. Uh, the first is one that really blew my mind when it first happened to me. I've since had some clients who had the same situation. These folks were building a real estate application. It handled rentals, essentially. So um, uh, I'll, I'll obfuscate a little bit because uh, I, uh, I don't know if they'd want me to name them. But um, they, they were doing amazing stuff. I was very proud to work with them. What they were doing was building this complex system for getting renters into houses and landlords getting paid and making sure all the official rules were followed and so on. Very complex process if you draw it out. And uh, this process uh, they had uh, done, implemented completely without code. Uh, there were no software engineers in the business. Um, there was one person who understood all the different tools that were in use. And um, for example, there were uh, tools that were like spreadsheets. These are things like Airtable or Google Sheets. Uh, there were bits like uh, If This Then That or Zapier uh, for connecting bits together. Uh, there were tools that interacted with email so that you could get an email to tell you it's time to pay your rent or you're overdue or whatever it was. Uh, and they'd hooked all these things together. There's really one guy who had mastered all the different types of tools. He had uh, figured out um, how he could get, uh, he was showing them off to me. He was very excited. He could get this bit to say, if this, then the other thing would happen, but no, not on Thursdays when the moon was full. He, he'd figured out all these amazing tricks to get these little pieces uh, of uh, off-the-shelf software to implement a very complex process that would take a person all the way from, gee, I'd like to rent your place, to moving in. And uh, utterly amazing. What they came to me for was not, hey, Squirrel, this is broken, because it was not broken. It was working really well. What they came to me for was understanding how to explain this to investors, because investors kept saying things like, can we see your database? And they'd say, we don't have one. The investors would say, what? And then the investors would say, what's your uh, plan to hire more engineers? They'd say, we don't have one. And the investors are so confused that they didn't give them more money. And they said, this is a problem. We have this great system. It's working. But nobody is uh, willing to give us more money. They don't understand us. So I had a long think. We, we hadn't invented, society hadn't, or technical people hadn't invented this idea of low code. Um, it was actually very familiar. I was working on something like this in 1999. So it had been around a long time, but nobody had a name for it, at least not that I knew. Um, so I thought for a long time, and then I told them, you should tell them it's a serverless application. 
because you don't have any servers. And we have this concept in, in technical circles of a serverless tool. Now, that's actually a different thing. Um, and they weren't using serverless as, say, Amazon Lambda provides it. Don't worry if you don't know what that is, because it doesn't matter. It was just a sneaky way of explaining it um, to them, uh, to their investors. They raised money. That was a successful strategy for them. And then they hired some engineers. So we'll talk at the end, um, I suspect, about how we handle that. What do you do when you've got uh, the, the situation where you're trying to build software with no engineers? And then you realize, actually, I really do need some code here. So um, uh, that's one story I wanted to tell you. And that's a happy story. That's all about how this low code approach of uh, hacking a bunch of pieces together without ever having any engineers turned out well for them. That, that was a really great success. I also want to tell you a failure story. Um, and that's of me. <laughs> so it's when I was a CTO. And back then, um, uh, this is when I was CTO of an e-commerce company. And uh, over and over again, we would get this low code pitch from our marketing department. They sat you know, a couple of rows away from us in this giant open plan uh, office. And uh, they'd come to us and they'd say, we've had a vendor come to us. They have this amazing idea. Don't worry, you won't have to do anything. All you have to do, all you have to do is put in this um, uh, one line of JavaScript. That's all, don't worry. You don't have to do a single thing more than that. Th that that's everything that, that you need to do. And uh, we, we learned after the first couple of times never to believe this because the problem was that um, the, the um, uh, vendor would come along and say, we have a low code solution the, and um, the uh, marketing people can do all the maintenance themselves. They can make sure everything that tracks the user and puts up the, you know, the little pop-up that comes up after you've been there for a while. I have one on my website. You know, that'll all be managed and they can update it and do any. All you need is this one line of JavaScript. None of this was true. Never believe it. If anybody comes and tells you that, it's it's just not so. And the problem is, of course, that the uh, you were trying to introduce one um, system, one mechanism, uh, on top of another that was never designed for it. Our web page, and uh, the collisions and challenges and problems we had from this were enormous until we just outlawed um, one line of JavaScript. They came to us and they told us that we'd just nod and listen patiently and then say. Yeah, let us talk to the vendor so we can find out what it is. We no longer cut and pasted the one line of JavaScript in. So uh, that's the kind of cautionary tale. Uh, I've told you the happy tale of what happens when you go and uh, try to do this um, and, uh, uh, and it works for you and you can raise money and you can get your uh, idea live quickly. That's fantastic. That's the good side. The problem is sometimes when you try to get a low-code solution to work with uh, other bits, other components, uh, an IT team that's already in place, you can get into real trouble, and we can talk more about that. Okay, I don't see any questions, so I assume you guys are stunned into silence and excited by what I'm telling you, so I'm going to have a drink of water and carry on. Right, so um, one of the things that's tremendously helpful in this situation is um, getting some diagrams and making sure you have some picture of how the pieces are going to fit together. Uh, a tendency, and this happens all the time in finance, I have a lot of finance examples for this, um, is that uh, nobody tries to master the complexity. They say, oh, we're not writing code. We don't have to do all that architecture stuff. We don't have to do all that uh, flow charts and trying to figure out the user journey and all this stuff, doesn't matter. We can just hack in whatever we want here in the code. It'll be fine. It's not fine. So uh, don't, don't expect that to work. Um, so the ones who've been successful, uh, and for example, these real estate folks uh, did this, will will have a whiteboard, you know, covering the wall, or they'll have a, a giant piece of paper, uh, a Miro board these days, right? So um, you might create a, an online version, but they have something that they can update, and that shows the workflow. And I, I'm emphasizing that concept. I'll come back to why in a minute. But um, the, uh, the, the, what it shows is uh, here's the first step that we're going to follow. For example, we, we get an application from someone who wants to move into one of our houses. And then we process that application here. A human being looks at uh, these parts and a, um, uh, a script that someone has created, a, a process that someone has that uh, looks at the details and checks, yes, this is a real human. It's not a bot. And then there's some other process, maybe the uh, formula in Excel that works out the income the person has put down and see if, says, sees if that's even close to what's needed to pay the rent and so on. So they, they define all of those steps. All of these things have to happen. And then this one, they're all feed in. So you get nice arrows that go in. I'm sure you can imagine the kind of thing I mean. And those all flow into here. And there's a decision. Yes, this is a person we're going to um, pursue further. Uh, and then we need to book a meeting with that person. And so on, all the steps all the way across until you get to the point where the person moves into the house. 
your process will be very different, I'm sure, in whatever situation you're uh, you're building your software. But that's the key notion: is is you want to map out all the steps and be able to modify it. Now, I'm emphasizing that it has to be the steps that you're working through. Um, what what are the actions? Um, because those steps might initially be done by humans when you don't have so many people using your system, and then later you're going to want to automate more and more of them. And uh, at, at some point, you may want to write some code, but you probably won't have to to start. Um, and, and this is the way that people get themselves in trouble: is they think they can skip the step. They kind of it's uh, you know the old boil the frog approach, where you you get it warmer and warmer, and nobody ever notices it's boiling until it's too late. Um, you, you get more and more and more steps, and you don't notice that what's happening is actually this is getting so complex that the step forty-seven is going to run into step thirty-two, and then if I update step twelve, it's going to break everything else. Um, and uh, a diagram, a, a workflow process can help you. Um, when you get further along, one thing that can help is uh, workflow tools. And there are lots of those around. Um, uh, ask me if you're not sure. Ask on the Squirrel Squadron forum. That would be a good place to find out about uh, what different tools people are using these days. I actually don't uh, know specific ones, um, but uh, happy to uh, look at what my clients are currently using, um, ask on the forum and so on uh, to find out more. But these are tools that will actually create these steps for you, um, will um, uh, analyze them, help you to, to automate each piece, will tie into the work that you're doing. And eventually, actual software can use this to um, orchestrate the steps. So um, uh, getting some kind of diagram that helps you understand the complexity is a tremendously useful thing. So I strongly advise that you get something like that. Right. Any more questions? I'm going to pause for a second because I'm thirsty. Uh, uh, throw in a question or two. Um, I'm not seeing them. I hope everything's working. I know my uh, good community manager, Laura, is checking. She's nodding at me. So she says, yep, all, all going as it should. It may just be stunned silence or maybe everybody's going to watch on the recording. That's fine, too. Uh, it'll be a shorter session with no questions, but if you have one, if you're thinking, gosh, this could never work, or I've tried this and it's not working for me, that would be great. Um, I know uh, one person in the audience, uh, uh, at least, um, is from the company I was working at in 1999. Um, so uh, uh, say hi if you're there, um, because uh, we were trying to build this back then, and um, I know that we had some challenges. I can tell stories, which you might uh, know better than me. Okay, uh, no questions. I'm going to carry on. Never a problem. Uh, I can uh, keep going on this, but, but uh, it may be a bit shorter. That's okay. Um, now, there's a challenge. I said, yeah, but draw a big diagram um, and, and use software that helps you manage the diagram. There's a failure here. There's a failure mode that's very dangerous. One failure mode I told you about was one line of JavaScript. If you ever hear that, ah, there's Rich. Hi, Rich. Nice to see you. Um, uh, uh, one very great danger, which, for example, that 1999 company mostly avoided, um, is the idea of visual coding. And somebody says, hey, you're drawing this diagram, and it's, it's capturing the processes that you're following. And you have uh, if this, then that over here, and you have error table over here, and you have an Excel sheet there. You have all those pieces. Uh, maybe what we could do is actually build a whole system that will incorp incorporate all those things. And don't worry, you don't need any engineers because everyone will just draw pictures. And somehow this will capture what the software will actually do and will run the picture. Uh, it'll be as if it's code, but it'll actually be a picture. Uh, people have been trying this for probably 40 or 50 years. I think my father probably tried it um, uh, in, in uh, mainframe programming in the 70s. I don't know that, but I suspect so. And it has never worked. Um, the, the unfortunate thing about this process, and it's different from what I was saying before, where you draw the diagram uh, for yourself, right? That, that helps you understand what are all the steps and make sure you haven't forgotten some dependency or something that happens. That's for a human to consume. The problem is that computers uh, are just not as good at understanding diagrams as people. So uh, what you're looking for is a way to get your hands on the complexity. If you hand it to a computer, you have a bigger problem. Because um, unfortunately, those tools tend to be almost impossible to maintain. Um, that you can create one diagram first. They demo really well. You know, oh, great, we'll create a little diagram and it'll do all the steps for us. It'll be wonderful. Uh, they get sold very well on the golf course or in the demo room. When you get them into the hands of actual people who are trying to use them, you get people updating pieces that don't aren't compatible. Uh, so I'll update my piece, and you'll update your piece, and suddenly they don't work together, and the computer doesn't notice. All the tools we have for managing text files in code, uh, those those don't work. They're not there. You can't do source control. You can't do uh, testing in the same way. Lots of the, the things that 
software developers use to manage complexity aren't available in these tools and there's not a human in the loop right there's not a person looking at the diagram so um uh, I, I would my uh, second piece of advice here after draw a diagram is for the love of god do not try to run the diagram right the diagram is not a program and if somebody tries to sell you that um Send, send them to me. <laughs> I'd be very happy to have a look at one. Maybe they'll be the first one that maybe somebody has mastered this and made this work. Um, but there's an awful lot of experience that suggests it's probably not going to. There's advantages of either having humans involved in the process who are managing the steps and reading the diagram, or eventually having actual software engineers who are sitting there writing actual real code. So uh, that's my advice on uh, visual coding. Now, um, one thing that does work really well, and the financial industry is absolutely brilliant at this, um, has had great, great success in, in the face of bad tools, um, and that is things like spreadsheets, Excel, um, that's the classic one for traders, you know, to create some massive, massive spreadsheets. I've seen some ones that would really curl your hair, um, uh, huge, huge uh, uh, numbers of columns, um, and, and very complex formulas, and they will make them work. Uh, uh, and and that's be, and even though Excel is not really built for this, right? Excel is not meant to be an application orchestrating lots of work, or or even one that um, uh, does financial trading. It, it's meant to help you do like your accounts and your balance sheets and stuff. That's what it was built for. But it is able to do it. And more modern tools like Airtable um, have kind of they've kind of looked at it and said, well, Excel is being used this way. How how could we make it actually a little easier to use? There are several of these around. Uh, Google Sheets is kind of in the middle. It's it's at least in the cloud, but it doesn't do much more. Um, but the good thing about all of these is, although it is visual in the sense that you have a spreadsheet and you have cells and you're putting things in them, um, you're actually creating inside each cell um, a, a, a sequence of very simple instructions. And the very helpful thing is those instructions are, are written. They're, they're some kind of uh, formula or um, essentially code, but it's very small. And it's small enough that people like traders who have a deep understanding of the, uh, of the industry, whatever it is they're trading in, um, but don't have um, uh, uh, coding skill, can do enough little bits of coding to just say, well, this one should be uh, three times that one. This one should be this one plus that one divided by the price of uh, eggs in China or whatever it is. And they can make the software work. So Excel does work, uh, and its its um, uh, descendants like Airtable, those work. That's that's good for um, uh, a sort of visual coding. It's the part where you actually try to draw the boxes and the lines between them, and the computer runs all the boxes. That's where you get into trouble. So stay away from that. Uh, we've got some questions. Hallelujah. So um, uh, we have Rich saying, uh, uh, "Have you actually? I can put Rich's question on the screen here. He's kept it short enough. I I think I can peek over it. I still have to figure out how to do this. This is a low code tool, by the way, right? I'm using Streamyard, which lets me do all these fantastic things. And um, you know, I've got Laura and me here, kind of making sure it all works. We're kind of pushing around the diagram, but we have a sequence of steps that we follow to get these up here and to run it. And we're doing that without having, having written any custom code, right? Streamyard." people are doing that for us. Rich says, have you come across any of the tools, Cluster 7 or Apparati, no, not those, but let's keep going, that are supposed to de-risk the use of complex end user developed spreadsheets by auditing them, finding errors, etc." No, I haven't, but I'm going to look. That sounds fantastic. And that's the kind of thing we learn from each other here in the Squirrel Squadron. So thank you, Rich. Um, I will have a look at those and comment on the forum because um, I'm interested in that. I did not know that was out there. Um, it's a very natural thing now that you think about it. If you've got all these people, not only financial traders, but lots of folks who have built these kind of complex low code systems based on spreadsheets sheets. Um, my question for those would be, do they work with the, the kind of next generation? Do they work with things like Airtable and Google Sheets and so on? It would, again, be very natural if they did, and it would be fantastic if they did. Because uh, Rich knows, I'll tell at least one story um, uh, from our, our um, time at you Devise. That was the name of the company because you were supposed to devise your own software. It was amazing. Um, it, it worked in, in many ways. But um, one of the things we often did was go to these um, financial institutions and we look at their spreadsheets, which we were replacing. We were at this final stage I'm going to be talking about in a minute, where we were actually taking our software and making it run to do what the spreadsheet did. And every single time we found an error in uh, cell XRQ943, and um, it, it always had led to some kind of error. Um, it led to reporting the wrong um, uh, wrong numbers to investors, um, giving the wrong signals, all kinds of other problems. And, and you couldn't find it. 
So uh, I think this is fantastic that somebody has tried to solve this problem. I'm interested to know um, how, how good it is. So Rich, I don't know, but I'm really glad to hear about it. And I will have a look and uh, come back to you uh, on the forum. Uh, great. And we have, uh, sorry, sometimes LinkedIn does this. All I see is LinkedIn users. So sorry, I don't know who this is. Um, and it's a long question, which is great, but I'm going to have to read it out because it'll it'll fill the screen. I, I, I can't look over it. Um, any thoughts on cost as you scale? I can imagine the benefit of low, no code would be testing ideas, especially with early stage business. My worry would be that you get locked into using third party systems just at the point when you are busy scaling and the cost and risk of using no code could lead to a new version of tech debt. Oh, boy. Uh, it certainly does. So uh, this is a great question. You come dependent on the third party uh, uh, solution becomes in, uh, increasingly expensive. Absolutely. And so here, here the crucial thing to do is to, to use building blocks uh, to take uh, pieces which are small and understandable and composable. I'll say more about that in a second. And not this kind of um, uh, one size fits all. You'll do all your code here. Everything will be perfect. Um, you'll be dependent on us, um, but you'll, you'll have everything work wonderfully. Um, because that actually was the business model of the company that uh, Rich and I were um, uh, working at long ago. And um, they did lock people in. And, and they found it very painful to scale after a certain stage. So what I've actually, with the model I've seen be much, much more successful is one like the real estate company that I started with. And um, in that one, uh, they had um, a little bit of if this, if this, then that, and a little bit of Zapier, and a little bit of Airtable, and a little bit of the next thing. Each piece was small and, under, and comprehensible. And um, if any piece stopped working or became super expensive or something like that, they could replace it pretty easily. And if they needed to, they could have a human do it. So, uh, you know, they had all the beautiful diagram all worked out on the wall and they could say, all right, well, step four is being handled by this system, but you know what, it's down today or uh, we're having a dispute or they, they have a bug or something. Okay, humans go and do this step. It's when you get completely dependent, exactly as this uh, question uh, questioner asks me, um, you, know, you get locked into the system and you have no other option. You can't have a human get in there and say, okay, I'm going to look in the cells in the spreadsheet, which are normally updated by this thing that runs in uh, in Zapier and, and it brings in the, the right information. I'm just going to go to the um, currency exchange or I'm going to go to the... Uh, um, you know, the weather report or whatever it is that I need to get in there. It's not, it's not working today. I'm going to go type it into the cells. And, and when you have that uh, option available, then you have a lot more flexibility. Uh, so I hope that's helpful to, to this person. If they have more questions on that, please feel free to ask. That's great. Glad to see the questions. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about this thing I keep uh, uh, foreshadowing here. Um, uh, and, and this question also uh, refers to it. What the heck do you do when this doesn't work anymore? Because it will not work forever, right? Facebook and Google and people of that size and that scale, Amazon, don't run on these systems. They use them um, in, in appropriate places, but um, you, know, you can't uh, serve uh, even uh, tens of thousands of users typically uh, on a um, hacked together thing that has a lot of uh, uh, individual steps. So whether you're at a tiny startup that's trying to um, prove a, a product market fit, or you're maybe at a more established business and you want to go into a new area, um, these tools can be tremendously helpful for learning quickly from customers, finding out whether there's even a market for what it is you want to do, um, working out whether you have the right steps, right? what are actually the steps that you need to follow. Um, but what do you do when it comes time to get some engineers in? Well, the good news is if you've done it the way I've described, that actually shouldn't be too painful. And that's uh, uh, what I've seen multiple times with my clients who've done this. Um, if, and again, using this example, a very helpful example from the, the person who asked me a question, um, uh, if, if you're kind of locked into a third party, you can't see inside to see what it actually does. Um, if the, the testing tools are missing, the kind of uh, standard ways of managing the complexity, those are all gone. Um, when, when all of that happens, then your engineers are going to show up and say, well, what the heck does this system do? How on earth do we do this? Uh, I'll tell you another story from that uh, same, actually the same e-commerce company. Um, there was someone who uh, had worked in the physical warehouse, and then we had kind of abstracted that. We'd hired a third party to, to run our warehouse, and so um, he was managing it, um, uh, the, the third party. And uh, he had the weirdest pieces of code and scripts and strange things that ran at screens that only he understood and he knew. You had to put something in the third cell down and click the fifth button, but none of them were labeled. You know, you couldn't be believe how much complexity he had created and documented none of it, right? So there was all these pieces and they were pretty low code because he was not a software developer, but he managed to make them all work. And uh, he'd defined this process, but he'd not followed my advice. <laughs> he had not documented anything. 
So we figured out this wasn't a very good idea after a while. And we said, hey, Paul, can, can, can you help us out here? What, what is it that you do? And uh, the unfortunate and interesting thing that Paul did at that point was to say, I won't tell you. And then he went on holiday. And he said, as he as he walked out the door, he said, uh, well, you know, good luck trying to figure this out while I'm gone. You know, uh, I have my job and you have yours. So he was pretty clearly communicating that um, uh, this was job security for him. <laughs> he had created this uh, mechanism uh, partly in order to ensure that he would have a job. Well, uh, the thing we did was that uh, when he came back, um, we set up something that would allow us to track what he was doing. So we could observe he was clicking the third button down and that was leading to this update and so on. And so it actually didn't take us too long to work out what Paul was doing. Uh, and then uh, Paul went on permanent holiday because um, we, we, we couldn't allow that kind of thing. And we did manage to replace the system. But man, it was painful, right? So don't get yourself in that situation. Now, Paul happens to be you know, kind of acting unethically there. I'm sure not, most of you do not have that problem. But you can certainly get yourself in exactly the same kind of mess by uh, uh, creating a system inadvertently, or maybe advertently like Paul did, um, but inadvertently create a mechanism, a system, a setup, where um, actually nobody knows what it does. And then it's going to be really painful to replace, because the engineers will turn up and say, well, how does this, this work? What do we do? On the other hand, if you've done what I've described and you have a beautiful diagram, you're able to follow the steps individually, you understand what, uh, uh, how all the pieces depend on each other, then the great thing you can do is replace one piece at a time. So the software engineers turn up and they say, you know, it seems to take forever for this spreadsheet to do what you want it to do. And you say, yeah, man, it's a pain. And we make mistakes in the in the formulas and so on. You know, we're, we're trying to check it with these tools that Rich was telling us about. But, man, it's painful. We'd like to get rid of the spreadsheet. And you say, where is it used? Well, it's used in step three and step seven. Here it is right here. And it gets this input and it gets that output. And the engineers say, great, I know what to do to replace that. And they can uh, uh, slot that in. They can have it take some of the traffic or do some of the, in the renting example, you know, some of the incoming renters and so on. So they can test it in a, in a safe way. Um, and then you'll replace pieces as you go. And, and then, of course, you never have the situation that all of us know, I hope, to, to avoid, which is this situation where you have one new system that you're building and you have the old system and you're trying to run them both at the same time and then switch over magically from one to the other. That uh, each story usually ends very badly. So uh, you have a much better situation where um, you can replace one little piece at a time and eventually you will evolve into um, the more custom system, the more scalable system that you want to have. Okay, so um, any questions uh, based on what we've covered? Because uh, that, that's what I've got prepared and um, uh, very happy to cover more things. You guys know I, I, I do well if you throw things at me. So uh, anything else people want to ask, throw it in the chat now. Stunned silence at the moment. I, I hope that I've helped uh, both Rich and the, the person who asked me a question before and that the rest of you are learning interesting things. Uh, do throw something in if you would like to. Uh, you can also come to the Squirrel Squadron Forum, which I mentioned. So um, that's a place where you can always come in. I'm uh, there every single day. Uh, answering questions, talking with people, bringing up new uh, uh, ideas, and the community responds. We get lots of interesting discussions there on all kinds of topics, including um, uh, how, how to use your roadmap effectively, um, what should you do when uh, you've got somebody like a Paul, uh, how do you handle a difficult conversation with them. So uh, Squirrel Squadron Forum, just go to squirrelsquadron.com. I'll put that up uh, in a moment, uh, and you can uh, get uh, lined up there. That's for uh, executive members of the Squirrel Squadron community. Oh, we do have an answer, a question. I don't know if it's the same person. LinkedIn's doing the same funny thing. Um, have you ever seen an example where it would make sense for someone who knows how to write code to use a no low code solution? Great question. Absolutely true. And I absolutely have seen that. Um, and the typical situation is one where you might have a, a very busy set of engineers or a small set. You know, they have something to do. But there, you have really knowledgeable domain experts, people who um, tremendously, uh, you know, their, their uh, understanding of what's happening is really, really great. And they understand your business really well. And um, uh, what they're trying to do is, is um, get, get a, a accelerated um, movement uh, in the software, get more features done. And they're frustrated because they can't. So then what you can do is take, all right, well, one engineer set up the mechanisms so that uh, for some portion of the application, but some part of whatever it is you're doing, that person sets up uh, something that allows those people uh, to do the additional work. And a very classic example of that um, is a, um, 
I have to obscure this one a little bit, uh, a trading application, let's just say that, in, in a particular sector. Uh, and I was helping them uh, to document and describe this system in a way that would help them uh, precisely for this purpose. So they, they wanted to uh, document what they had. And what they had was a, a fair amount of uh, individual code. And then it all tied into this giant spreadsheet, which is a very classic thing for, for uh, banks to do. Uh, and, and they weren't a bank, but they were doing a similar kind of thing with this uh, trading uh, of, of particular uh, uh, items. And um, uh, what they had done was to have their engineers create hooks all over the place and special functions and other things because there's a small number of engineers and lots of traders. And the traders could say, ah, we've invented a new product. We have a new thing. We want to trade one of these against one of those, except on Thursdays when the moon is full, we're going to do this other thing. And they would draw the nifty diagrams and whatever they needed to do. Um, and then they would go into Excel and they would go into the cells and they would use the pieces. So they are actually using it as if it were a, a low code solution for um, uh, the rest of the system. Uh, uh, the rest of the system written by de the in-house developers was like um, uh, another low code component. Um, and they had uh, set it up so that it was very easy for those folks to invent new things quickly because the engineers could not keep up with the traders, right? They could invent new derivatives and weird things and you know all the crazy stuff that uh, financial engineers do. They could do that all day and there were lots of them, but the engineers had created mechanisms that allowed them to do that. So uh, I hope that's useful to that person. Um, that's absolutely a, um, uh, an example where that can work and there are others. So uh, good question, glad you asked. Great, so uh, uh, I'm gonna close there unless uh, somebody wants to throw in a final question. Uh, got the uh, website for the Squirrel Squadron up there. So we're doing uh, lots more events. Um, those uh, include uh, ones on risk and fear in the next uh, couple of weeks. We're taking off for the Jubilee next week, but uh, resuming our normal service with uh, weekly events. Uh, some of them are uh, live streams like this. Some are Zoom calls. Um, uh, and uh, they're always free. This is uh, my way of giving back. So uh, feel free to join, uh, get um, uh, onto the forum and uh, ask questions there, participate in uh, future events. Uh, would love to see you at more of those. Uh, thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. Have a wonderful day. Oh, did I put it up wrong? Oh, uh, Laura is also putting it up. So we're, we're, oh, she's put it on LinkedIn. That's because Laura is clever uh, and I didn't realize that. So uh, come and find me there. Uh, would, would love to uh, chat with you more. Have a fantastic evening. Thanks, everybody.